Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, available on Pacifica Radio, on Progressive Radio Network, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on SoundCloud, and at opednews.com slash podcasts, where the complete archives of the show are available. I, my guest for this show is Peter Hawkins. He's professor in leadership at Henley Business School and founder and emeritus chair of Bath Consultancy Group. He's worked with many leading global companies, and he's the author of Leadership Team Coaching and Leadership Team Coaching in Practice, two books that are really solid in terms of the, the detailed information that's available. Uh, uh, in, in, in the book, Leadership Team Coaching, you say in the introduction, focusing on business as usual is at best myopic and at worst suicidal which gives an idea of your attitude towards doing things the way they usually are. So, so great to have you on the show. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Rob. Good, good to be with you and chatting. And, to and you know, I, I kind of stumbled on you. I, I was browsing through SoundCloud and I discovered an interview with you. And I think in the notes, it said something about WeQ, an idea that that you describe there's iq which in in the way i think you present it is me q <laughs> and then there's we q and you know, i i've i call this show is the bottom up show because i believe we're transitioning from a top down to a more bottom up culture and that's a good thing that there's too much top down in our culture today and we need to get back to bottom up which is the way humans were for most of their existence. So I, I, and I, I hit the word WeQ and it was like, whoa, what a wonderful concept. And then I discovered you've got a whole lifetime body of work behind how to do it. And yeah. uh, that, that's, it's wonderful. Uh, and in, in your books, you talk about not only the idea of having a, a, a leadership team approach, this WeQ approach that, is for business, but that also that if we're going to change the world, we need to change the business leaders in the way they think to shift from thinking about just being individuals leading a business to being a, a, a team collaboration, cooperation, coordinator, and orchestrator uh, to uh, who, that works with a consciousness of all the people, all the stakeholders, which include all the, all the local people and the neighborhoods and the communities and nature itself. And yep. boy, if, if that could happen, then corporations, rather than being to many people the enemy, the, 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 the problem causers, they could be the ones that could change the world. That would be, a, and that would be within capitalism too. Yeah, but it's it's a different source of capitalism. So I think I think uh, what what are the key turning points? And I and I picked up on the term WeQ because looking at coaching, which became very popular in the last part of the last century, in the beginning of this, a lot of executive coaching has helped people move from an IQ sort of cognitive left brain hemisphere based learning to a EQ, a more emotional and relational based learning. And I think that's been quite important in, in the shift that did happen. But as we come into the 21st century, I don't think it's enough because I still think a lot of what we call leadership development and, and executive coaching is, is still developing 20th century leaders, not 21st century leadership. And, and I think it's that focus that, that goes through a lot of my work, which is about how do we, first of all, realize that uh, the day of the heroic leader is past and gone. The world is too complex and changing too fast. We need collective collaborative leadership. And then also at the same time, how do we move from what Michael Porter, you know, the great American uh, strategy guru, when he in 2011 said, look, we need to move from focusing on shareholder value to focusing on shared value. 
That is creating value for all the organization's stakeholders. And you mentioned a few, Rob, you know, the, the, not only the shareholders, but the customers, the suppliers, the employees, the communities where the organization operates and gets its legitimacy and support. And what I call the, the more than human world of nature. So, so how do we make sure we've got stakeholder-centered businesses? And that means we need stakeholder-centered leadership, which means we need stakeholder-centered leadership development, which is collective and collaborative. I love it. You know, I, all this stuff you're describing, I think of as a bottom-up way of seeing things and doing things, really as compared to the top-down way, which is the, the 20th century individual hierarchical leadership model. Yeah, although I, I would add to that and say, it's not just how do we not just have top-down or bottom-up, also how do we have side-to-side -side leadership? Because increasingly, a lot of leadership isn't about leading, you know, my team, my people, my function. It's about how do we create connection and collaboration across boundaries. I, I know I, you've been reading my the research I did uh, for Henley Business School called uh, "Tomorrow's Leadership and the Necessary Revolution in Today's Leadership Development." And, and in that, Rob, we we interviewed leaders, HR directors, and, and, and future leaders, young millennials who are the leaders of tomorrow, uh, about the changing challenges for organizations. And many of the CEOs said, look, in the next 10 years, we're going to be employing less people due to digitalization, robotization, outsourcing. But they all said, the number of people we will have to partner with to be successful will get much greater. And the other thing, you, you talk a lot of, about uh, systemic ideas as well, systemic yeah. leaderships. Well, I, just to complete that point, Rob, you see, I think that means we have to stop thinking about, about leadership in the vertical dimension, top down, just bottom up vertically. But we've got to start to think about leadership being leading across a team, but also leading in terms of the team and all the other stakeholders. How do we partner with the many people we have to partner with in order to have a successful enterprise? Well, it, the way I think of bottom up is it is systemic. Uh, the, the, the vertical is the top down model. The systemic uh, it model is the bottom up way, way of thinking. And uh, so what you're saying just fits perfectly. I, yeah. I love this idea that if you're going to have a business in today's world, because it's not just about leadership, it's about doing business, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's about thinking systemically. Uh, I, I, I think about it as connection consciousness. You've got to think about all the connections. Very nice. Very nice. And, and you see, if you, if, you, if you look at teams, which I've written a lot about, yes. the danger is a, a lot of team development has focused on trying to make the team a high performing team and and that i now believe is a false concept because high performance does not reside in the team right it always but always resides between the team and its whole systemic and stakeholder context yeah. Now, does that apply to athletic teams? I mean, I think with athletic teams, it does apply to the team. But when you're talking about putting it into effect in a business or an organization or government, that's a different story. Or maybe it is also with the athletic team. It's very interesting. In, in um, the third edition of my leadership team coaching book, I did a, a case study of, a, of the most successful uh, rugby team. Yeah, that one, Rob. And uh, Saracens in the UK playing British rugby, you know, the, the, uh, the original form before the Americans developed American football. <laughs> and uh, the one without shoulder pads. And uh, they are probably the most successful club team in the world right now. And what's interesting is they have a very stakeholder-centric approach, right? 
that they're very value driven. So just to give you a couple of examples. If they interview an international rugby star to come in and play for them, they insist they turn up for the interview with a member of their family, you know, their wife, their mother, whoever. Because they said, look, unless the family, this is going to work for their family, it's not going to work having them as part of the team. I love secondly, that. Unless they are a, a, a team player at home, they're probably not going to be a team player at work. So, you know, they see the families. And then if the wife says, well, look, you know, I'm coming from New Zealand to, to North London and, and, you know, I've got my own business at New Zealand. I don't know how to start one here. They'll say, well, look, perhaps we can find a mentor for you from one of our supporters. And they also have a foundation they involve the players in, which is supporting uh, autistic children, is supporting people coming out of prison. And they involve the players in that because they say, look, you know, good teamwork on the pitch is created by good teamwork off the pitch. So even there, even with the sports team, I would say we have to move from seeing the high performances just between the, the 11 players, but between the players, the management, the families, the supporters, the, the finances, the brands, all of that is part of the systemic, uh, sis the wider systemic nested systems that creates the success in the team. Well, I have to say that is about the most joyful me being corrected that I've experienced. That was great. I love learning that. It, it just makes it, it the, the dimensionality of this even more valuable and important. They're everywhere you look. I think it's, 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 it's wonderful, really. But let's, I want to take a step back and ask, what is leadership team coaching? Let's get a basic definition down. Maybe a couple. Yeah. So, so le leadership team coaching is not something done by a team coach. It's something done between a team coach and a, a senior leadership team working in partnership to help that team better serve all the stakeholders they are there in service of their board, their shareholders, their employees, yeah, the, the organization, customers, the partner organizations and suppliers, the communities, the ecology, the more than human world. So, so it's very much um, not just looking at the team dynamic, but it starts, I, I have this model of the five disciplines. Right, that, that a leadership team to be effective must be good at all five. The first discipline is their commission. Are they clear about what they have to collectively achieve together? Why they're a team? What they can do together they can't do apart. Yeah. Because they're not, they don't become a team just by all reporting to the CEO or the same leader. So commissioning is the first discipline. The second one is clarifying. Are they all on the same page about what their key objectives are? What, what are the things they have to achieve and, and what are their team KPIs as opposed to their individual key performance indicators? And are they clear about the roles and the processes as well as the goals? That's the clarifying discipline. You like that? The, the, the what, the first one is the why. Only then can we start to look at the third discipline, the co-creating, which is how does the team need to function to, to achieve the what and fulfill the why. That is the traditional area of, of, of how does the team meet, has it structured its meetings, um, what are the team dynamics, the team culture, how do they build collaboration between them internally. So we've got the why, the what, the how. The fourth discipline is really essential because we could do all of those three and still we haven't, we haven't created value. We've just laid the foundations. The fourth discipline is connecting. How do we connect with all our stakeholders? And we've already mentioned you know, six types of stakeholders. And the fact that in today's organization, that the number and complexity of stakeholders has got much greater 
and changing faster. So the connecting discipline is critical because the days when the only person who could represent the whole organization was the CEO no longer works because there's, there's far too many stakeholders and the rate of change is far too fast. So if that's the only point of integration, it doesn't work. So the whole top team have to be able to represent the whole organization to the myriad of stakeholders, right? Not just their bit, not just the HR person talking to the employees and the salesperson to the customers and the finance director to the investors. It doesn't work like that any longer. And then finally, the, the, the fifth discipline is core learning. Because if you were just doing those four, you would just become better and better at playing yesterday's game. So unless you're growing your collective capacity constantly and learning how to be future fit, rather than always chasing the problems of yesterday, unless you're learning and developing and growing your capacity as a team, you're not future fit. You're only becoming better at yesterday's game, not learning how to play tomorrow's game. So that's why in that fifth discipline, increasingly the role of the team leader is to be team orchestrator and team coach, growing the individual and collective capacity of everybody in the team and the whole team. Okay, so you've, you've given a lot of wonderful theory. I love everything you're saying. I want to throw in something that you have in your book. You cite uh, Katsuaki Watanabe's reply mm. to the question of why Toyota was more profitable and successful than America's big three car makers combined. And he answered, in Toyota, everybody works as a team. We even call our suppliers our partners, and we make things everybody thinks we should make, end quote. Yeah. What is that, how does that fit into your model, and what does that teach us? Well, if you look at Toyota, and, uh, and, and I, I've done quite a bit of work just recently in Japan and China, and one of the things that always amazes me is they have a much more communitarian approach to how to do organizations. So, you know, I talked to a Chinese company recently and said, look, t tell me about your, you know, research and development and how you stay ahead of the game. They said, oh, well, we'll introduce you to the people who, who run our global competitions. We don't do our research and development. We, we put out a competition to the world and get people to compete to come up with the best solutions to our next product. It's that's crowd crowdsourcing, bottom up yeah. crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing your R and D, and then I said, well, you know, what about your marketing department? And they said, well, we've got these people who organise the parties for all our best customers because our customers are our sales force. Yeah, we wouldn't think of developing a new product without involving our customers and helping us design it and helping us sell it. They're part of our organization. So, so I now say to HR directors, you've got to wake up to the fact that in the future, most of, your, most of the people who will make your, your firm successful will not be on your payroll, right? We have to think that most of the people will be beyond the, the organizational chart, the organizational boundaries. And it's a matter of how do we, how do we collaborate and orchestrate with them? And, and this word partnership that's in that quote is so critical. Yeah, most uh, organizational leaders and most indeed politicians don't understand partnership. <laughs> uh, you know, another word that's really important is boundaries. Uh, the idea it makes me think of Ken Wilber's book, No Boundaries. Yeah. Because what you're describing is reconceptualizing a business as not having specific boundaries, as having, having relationships and connections that are really not separable. They're essential parts. And as soon as a business recognizes that, the more they're going to be able to fully tap the power of those connections. Yeah. So, so you, you still conceptually need to have some notion of, you know, who's in the team, who's not in the team, who's at, at what level, et cetera, and who's focusing on what functions. 
but you need to make sure the boundaries don't become barriers and divisions. Ah, nicely put. Yeah. So we need to take a brief break now. I'm going to pause for the radio show so we can put in a bumper. My guest for the show is Peter Hawkins, professor in leadership at Henley Business School and founder and emeritus chair of Bath Consultancy Group. He's the author of Leadership Team Coaching and Leadership Team Coaching in Practice. Uh, what, what's your website, by the way? Yeah, the, 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 um, all my trainings now go out through Renewal Associates. The website is www.renewalassociates, all one word, .co.uk and that has lots of blogs by me and also many of the trainings in the leadership retreats that I organize. Great. So you mentioned something at the very beginning that I'm fascinated by. Uh, you talk about the death of the heroic leader and you, in, in, in your writings you talk about collective leadership and that that's distributed leadership. Now, in, in my book, Bottom Up Revolution, I write about how we need to transfer from the idea of an individual superpower elite hero to a collective hero. Uh, and I, I get into the idea of the hero's journey. How Joseph Campbell described the hero's journey. And we need to shift. We need to get our culture. We need to get our storytellers to switch to a collective hero where we all save the world. But you're specifically talking about it within a management or a leadership concept. So talk, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm still, I, I, I worry a still a bit about the term hero, even collective hero, and that we're gonna save the world. Uh, because I still think the danger of it is that it doesn't put us back into the right place of humility. You know, we're the people who've messed up the world. I think it's learning from the, what I refer to as the more than human world, right? That the, the world that we are part of and, and, and should be a, a, um, a small part of, that, that that, that with that language, it puts us back into the right relationship. We need to learn from the more than human world rather than feel that heroically we're going to sort out the environment. When you talk about the more than human world, you talk, you're talking about nature. You're talking about all life forms. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking about the wider ecology. But to realize the wider ecology is also part of us. Absolutely. It's not out there. So, so I have this, this uh, lovely story of, of talking to uh, executive coaches and saying how we have to recognize that the ecology is part of every coaching conversation and every team meeting. And they said, oh, but it's not our job to bring the ecology into the coaching room. And I said, what, what do you mean by that? I said, do your, do your coaches not eat? Do they not breathe? If they eat and breathe, the ecology is in the room already. How do we wake up to the fact and attend to it rather than ignore it? I've had a couple conversations over the years with Noam Chomsky, and he's talked about the need to pay attention to externalities. And usually he refers to ones that are undescribed costs, yeah. like polluting the environment. But the other side of externalities are those positive dimensions. Like if, when a business uh, brings jobs, that's a good thing. If a bi business looks at the community and helps support the local culture, that those are externalities of a sort that can really make a difference for a community. And I, I think that that's where nature and, and the, the broader aspect that you're talking about ties in in, in some ways. Yes, but you see it when you mention thinking systemically, there's two levels to that. So, so first of all, I agree with you. We, we're gonna look at um, both um, unexpected consequences of what we're doing and how we're exporting our costs into the environment, into the developing world, yeah? 
In fact, my good friend Margaret Heffernan, who wrote Willful Blindness, somebody else you should really interview, amazing woman, uh, ex-CEO, who's written some very, very good books. And she, she had her book launch for her last book, that competition. Um, she was asked, what, what message would you leave people? And she said, well, look, what I'd like you to do is every time people say, we, we, we have cut costs, please ask them where have they moved those costs to? Ah, beautiful, yes. Because mostly when we talk about cost, cutting costs, all we've done is we've moved them somewhere else in the world. We have cut pollution by exporting all our, our plastic manufacture and our coal, our coal making and steel making. We export the other side of the world and then we blame them for their pollution. Right? There's this lovely story about 1992, the original President Bush, at the Rio summit, the developing countries came to him and said, it's unfair that you're expecting us to cut carbon emissions at the same rate you are. You are. Because a lot of what we produce is producing to support American consumerism. Do you know what his answer was? The American way of life is not up for negotiation. Hmm. And I think that story says a lot. It does. Because that's how we export our hidden costs. But you see, if we're thinking systemically, we have to think in nested systems. The individual within the team, within the function, within the organization, within its business niche, within the human family, within the, the, the ecology. But we also have to realize that we mustn't just think in that dimension. We have to realize that all those systems that we are nested within are nested within us. So when, when the leader turns up for coaching, the team dynamic turns up inside them. The organizational culture turns up inside them. Their ethnic and national culture. Yeah, that their... Their, their, their assumptions from their, their cultural assumptions from the world they come from turn up inside them. Makes me and, think of uh, fractal leadership. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So we have to think in, the, in those two dimensions of nesting. So we still have boundaries, but, but we, we have to be more interested in the connections between boundaries than in what resides within the boundary. It also makes me think of mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are all about empathy and our ability to uh, be aware of what somebody else is feeling or doing. And what you just described is a kind of a business version of that. Yeah, because empathy is about discovering the other within me. And, and, and I've written recently about the notion of wide-angled empathy. Because what? we've... With EQ, we've become better and better at having empathy for the people inside the room with us. Yeah, like you with me and me with you, because we're talking face to face. But what we then do is we project all the evil and the bad onto the people not in the room. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and teams will talk about you know, them, us and them, the board. We can't do that because the board is so awful. I like you in, 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 in one of your books, you talk about how you were doing some consulting and the people you were coaching were complaining about the CEO and you yeah. got tired of hearing about it. And, and you basically told them that they had to take responsibility and it's, well, go ahead. You finish that. Yeah. Story. I said, I, I said, I'm fed up with you all telling me about what's wrong with your CEO. I said, I think you're, you're, you're playing the game. Of, of waiting for the perfect CEO or waiting to be the perfect CEO, right? And I said, I got some bad news for you. I've never met one. So when are you as a team going to ta start taking responsibility for his weaknesses? And that CEO was sitting right next to me at the time. And, and I was slightly shocked by, by, by my intervention, but uh, it woke the team up. And, and that reminded me of another story uh, that you tell in your book about Nasruddin who was looking for yeah. a wife. Can you tell <laughs> that perfect. story? Yeah. It's, uh, I, I love the Nasruddin stories. He was the archetypal wise fool 
um, that lived somewhere in what's now Eastern Turkey. And his, his stories right through the Middle East and the Far East keep getting updated every, every generation. So I did a little book called The Wise Fool's Guide to Leadership, huh. um, which is kind of short Nasruddin stories, but Nasruddin being updated, because I decided if you were a wise fool, what would you do in the 21st century? You'd either become an executive coach or an organizational consultant or the host of a podcast series. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Nasruddin is, is, is helping people uh, select their new CEO as an organizational consultant. And, and um, they, they ask him if he'd ever been married. And he said, oh, he said, you know, alas, I, I, when I was young, I went off searching for, for the most beautiful wife in the world. And, you know, I, I went to France. I found this lovely woman. But un, un, unfortunately, you know, I couldn't speak her language and she wasn't very educated. So that didn't work. And then I, then I traveled and then I found this incredibly brilliant wife. She was so educated and loved culture, but unfortunately there was no attraction between us. And then finally, so I went to India and I, I, I met this beautiful woman who was cultured, educated, fantastic looking. We, we you know, I, I found her so attractive. And there was a long pause and they said, well, did you not marry her? Hadn't you finally found the perfect wife? He said, unfortunately, she was looking for the perfect husband. <laughs> and, and, you know, I wrote a blog linked to that, Rob, which uh, was, was titled, Partnerships Are Not Created by Partners. Quite a provocative title. And I started it to, to say I, I was writing it just before my 40th wedding anniversary. And that wasn't irrelevant. And I was also at that time working on an important financial merger between two of the largest uh, investment finance houses. Right? And I point out in both cases, whether it's marriage or whether it's a merger, it's not the partners that create the quality of the partnership. So, so the financial merger had come to me and they said, look, please help us with how we merge our two cultures. And because we want to create the best of both. And on face value, you'd think that was a good intention. Yeah. But I said, I wouldn't start with that question. They said, what do you mean? I said, if you start with how do we create the best of both through this merger, and they were very, very different cultures right? They were like chalk and cheese. I said, if you start with that question, you'll spend the next two years arguing about who's got the best HR systems, who's got the best investment products, who's got the best investment uh, analysts, and, and, and you'll just be competing for two years. I said, you need to ask another question. What is it that we can give birth to through this merger that neither of us could have achieved by ourselves that the financial world of tomorrow needs. What could we do together that we couldn't do apart? This is a question that you, I think you apply across the board, really. Absolutely. I apply it to, to my marriage and other people's marriages. I apply it to mergers. I apply it to teams. It's not the team, the leadership team, and some expensive hotel. You know, I spent years doing this, taking top teams away to expensive hotels to work on their mission and vision. And I realized that we had it wrong. It's not the team that create the mission and vision. It's the purpose, the mission and vision that creates the team. The purpose is already out there in the world waiting for a team to respond. It's the quality of the purpose that creates the collaboration not the collaborators. Now, that's different than the 20th century model. What's the 20th century model? Well, the 20th century model was we would sit around in, in this expensive hotel and talk about, you know, what do, what do we want to achieve with this organization? Now, what's our vision of success? Where do we want to take this organization to? So it's very egocentric, right? Rather than asking, what is it we as an organization can uniquely do that the world of tomorrow needs, right? 
what's the need that because of where we're located because of our history our people our capabilities our connectivity and our network our, our, our culture our knowledge all those things put together what is it we can uniquely do that's needed by the world of tomorrow and that that implies a profoundly different value system for a, a a business to have really rather than how can we make the most profit which is really the underlying question of so many businesses yeah and despite the fact that a lot of research will show that successful entrepreneurs and many successful businesses make more profit by not being profit centric right they make more profit and, and create good value for their stakeholders, for their shareholders by being purpose driven and by focusing on a future need that they are uniquely positioned to respond to. The, uh, I'm, I've been involved in the world of positive psychology and you don't get happy by trying to be happy. You engage in practices yeah. and ways of living that will make you happy but if you pursue happiness directly that's not the way that it works the best same idea absolutely yeah so so, so the way that uh, john greenleaf talked about servant based leadership we have to have service based organizations so one of the first questions i will ask a team is not you know not what help you need but but tell me about you as a team and tell me about who your team is in service of. Oh, nice. Yeah. I used to ask them, what do you want from team coaching? It was a very dumb question, right? Because all they would do is they would say, oh, let me tell you about, you know, what, what we need help with is sorting out our boss or what we need help with is, is Fred. No, right? no. Then to Fred, they'll say, oh, no, we, I, what we need help is to sort out Jane. And all I would get was all their, their interpersonal and their organizational noise. Now I'll ask them, who are you in service of? What do those people need you to step up to? And how can I help you step up to meet the needs of all those people you're in service of? And how do you help them? Well, the, 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 the first phase of my engagement, I, I say, look, I, 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 won't, I won't take on a contract until I know, and we've done an inquiry phase in a, in a collaborative inquiry and a collaborative diagnosis of what's the gap between what you're doing at the moment and what the world of tomorrow needs and all your stakeholders need. So that means we have to do an inquiry phase about who are their critical stakeholders, how do they see the team? So we often will use a, a team 360 not commenting on the individuals but how do they, the, the, their people their customers their, their, their board other parts of the organization see them as a collective team and we'll look at so what, what's the world telling us that about where you need to step up and then we'll together with the team design a development program which may include some workshops but also very importantly, sitting in on some of their regular team meetings, and do what I call timeouts, where we, we stop the process and look at what's going on in the room and how do we shift gear? Yeah. Okay. You know, it, it, you, I like, you, you cite Mark Drool's idea. He calls for a shift from striving to be the best in the world to being the best for the world. What a difference. Yeah. Uh, very subtle change of wording isn't it but a total change a metanoia of mindset of, uh, of the way we're looking now the problem is so many big companies are not stakeholder oriented they're shareholder or oriented and there's a huge difference there how do you get them to shift so well, I, we've got to do a show ID first, and then you'll talk about that right after the show ID. Okay, we'll pause for Thanks, a few seconds for the video. My guest for the show is Peter Hawkins, professor in leadership at Henley Business School and founder and emeritus chair 
of Bath Consultancy Group, and he's the author of Leadership Team Coaching. So we were discussing, keep going. Yeah, we're discussing how do you help an organization shift from a rather myopic uh, quarterly returns, short-term shareholder perspective to a long-term stakeholder-centric perspective. And, and I don't think you can just teach that. I, I think you have to help people confound their current way of thinking. So I think um, one of the ways is to engage leaders individually and collectively and asking them what really matters to them. I worked with one team and I got them to, to read, to write the obituary they would like their colleagues to write about them and speak at their funerals. Just to give them a very different perspective on what they were doing. Um, Love it. Love it. Uh, I, I, when I left Bath Consultancy Group and started Renewal Associates, because we sold the business in 2010, I, I started to look at what I could uniquely do and how I could spend the next um, 10, 20 years of, of my kind of working life. And since that time, one of the commitments I made is I would never do a talk without including a picture of my five grandchildren. And when I put up that picture, it changes the atmosphere in the room. And I do it with leadership teams because it starts to open the heart. And I say, these are the people keeping me working. Right? Because I know, you know, and I sometimes say, why do you think they're keeping me working? And, and the accountants in the room will say that you're probably subsidizing their, their parents' mortgages. And I say, no, no, that's why I sold my consultancy business. <laughs> to do that. I said, no, that, that's another reason they're keeping me working is because the one thing I know is that these little people, when they grow up and get through school and get through university, inshallah, God willing, they go into the world of work and they become leaders. They will face far, far bigger challenges, far more complexity than anything my most privileged generation has had to face. All right? And I said, I think we are letting these little people down. So what I've done in that is I've changed them from responding with their head to responding from their heart. I've changed them from short-term focus to thinking long-term, multi-generations. Yeah. And I'm really saying indirectly by, comment, by telling the story about myself, what are you doing for the next two generations coming after you? And, you know, I really believe, uh, I've been thinking about this and writing about it a little bit, is people need to change their idea of what success is. And yeah. this is what you're doing here. You're redefining success. When you talk about looking at stakeholder interests instead of shareholder interests, when you start talking about orchestrating business ecosystems, which you just refer to in your writing, you're talking about a whole different way of seeing what success looks like. And, and, and it helps by the fact that, you know, I can say, listen, I have, I have sold three businesses, right? <laughs> I have chaired several small companies. So I'm, I'm not saying this from some, uh, evangelical external viewpoint i'm saying it from having been involved in creating business success right so when i have chaired small companies as the non-exec chairman my annual report would always follow the format of what have we received from each of our six major stakeholder groups what value have we received and what added value have we created the six groups were for our shareholders, for our customers, for our employees, 
and contractors, for the communities where we operate, and for the ecology or more than human world. And I would hold the business to account for having created an added value for all six. Because I'd say, if we're not creating added value for any, if we fail to create added value for any one of those, it will come back to haunt us and will undermine us as a sustainable business. It makes me think this, this ought to be the law. I mean, every company should be evaluated that way in terms of being responsible to all the, the stakeholders. Yeah, and, and we, need to, we need to change how companies are audited to, to include what, they, what value they are creating for all those groups and what value they are taking and yes. what hidden costs they are exporting, to mention what you mentioned earlier, Rob, into those groups. I want to get into the, 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 the description, the idea of orchestrating business ecosystems. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it, it links to what I said earlier about increasingly the complexity of who we have to partner with across boundaries is getting greater and more complex and is constantly changing. So, you know, I've worked in some sectors where, where people who are your competitors in, in one part of the world are your, are your suppliers in another part or your distributors in another part or your, you know, um, so you know, Coca-Cola will will be bottled by their competition in some parts of the world. Yeah, or distributed by competition in another part. So, so this is very complex. We're having to learn how to be collaborators to be able to compete and collaborate. Collaborators. Yeah, some people talk about cooperation, but I, I prefer collaborators. It Good comes term. off the line easier. And um, th th therefore, we need to think about not how do I lead my organization, my team, my, my function, my, my section. We need to think about how do we become orchestrators of all the people who we need to bring into relationship to fulfill the purpose that, that our organization is set up to achieve. So, so we have to be purpose-centric, stakeholder-centric, and that means we then have to look at who are all the necessary uh, people and connections, to, to use the word you used earlier, Rob. What are all the connections that we have to make work to deliver on that purpose? You're going back to your five C's. Yeah. And that I'll just throw I, 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 on commissioning, clarifying, co-creating, connecting, and core learning. Yeah, but, but not just seeing those five C's within a team or just within an organization, but within a, a, a whole um, ecosystem, a, a business ecosystem. Yeah. Which is everything that it, it, your, your organization touches and is connected to. Yeah. And yeah. They, but both those they serve and those they are supported by, and, and often people, as I explained earlier in that Chinese example, the people who you serve are also the people who are support who are serving and supporting you. There's a, a reciprocity of difference. Absolutely. So uh, before we finish, I want to be really clear. What are the credentials to be a leadership team coach? Well, we we've been running over the last ten years programs around the world. I think we we've been in thirty different countries. Uh, in that time, and we run both a, a three-day certificate in, in systemic team coaching, we call it. So how to do team coaching, not just within the team, but, but coaching the team and how they engage with their whole stakeholder world. We also now run a, a one-year diploma that's been running in, 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 uh, out of Europe for the last nine years, um, also the last three years out of Johannesburg, and we're just about to start in both... Um, uh, Beijing and in New York. So January, we start in New York a one-year diploma program for people who may be coaches or consultants or leaders who want to learn how do we develop effective leadership teams which are future fit to come and, and, and do that one-year training. It's five modules of, of, uh, of three days each module, um, but in between they go out and they work with teams. 
And they can find out more about that at renewalassociates.co.uk. Yeah, absolutely. And look up US Diploma or depending on which country they're interested in. And you're going to be involved in the US one in New York, right? Yep, yep. I will, I will be out there um, several times next year uh, and doing a three-day training, I think somewhere around Martin Luther King Day in January. But very appropriate day to be, be, be running this training. Because he was a person who, who who saw the world through collaborative and connection eyes. Ah, I love it. Yes. So I, I've, I've still got two more pages of questions that I, I haven't barely touched on yet. So I want to just cover some of them. Um, you, you talk about the 70-20-10 principle. Now, I look at that as something that's a really bottom-up way of seeing learning. Uh, so yep. describe what it is. Well, th this was the principle, um, not invented by me, but um, I think by CCL and uh, others, that 70% that of what one needs to learn to be a manager and a leader, you learn through doing it. But that 70% is supported by the 10% that, that, that you, you need to learn by going on programs, and, and, and the 20%, which needs to be supporting you in linking the, the, the theories and the models to the practice and the practice to be reflected on. We need to all be reflective practitioners. So that 20% includes coaching, it includes peer reviews. So we need to have learning leaders and learning teams. Yeah, And that means we, we have to be able to uh, be constantly reflecting on what's working, what's not working, um, and constantly uh, and agilely innovating how we're managing and learning. And that's a lifetime process. Well, I guess the part I think, the, the bottom-up aspect of it is that, you know, learning is 70% doing and actually being out in the world and connecting. And that is the most important part of learning. Then, and yeah, but if we go back to the, the, the kind of the whole... Um, Cold learning cycle. Yeah, we've got we've got thinking and and then planning and rehearsing. Then we then we've got the doing and the action. But then we've also got the reflection. And it, it was Donald Schoen who talked about the reflective practitioner. Talk a little bit more that. about reflection. Explain what that what you mean by that. Well, it, it's 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 um it, if. Too many organizations that, that they, they do planning, do, plan, do, plan, do. So what doesn't work, they just try something else. They don't do uh, let, Let's look at what did work in that change process. What, what was helpful, what wasn't helpful? What, what, what were the, the contributors to it, to it not succeeding? So how do we harvest the learning from our doing? And, and Donald should have talked about not just reflection post action after action reviews but how do we have reflection in action how when we're having a team meeting right and i've sat in so many team meetings that have become habituated you know i asked one team why do you have this wednesday morning meeting they said because it's our wednesday nine o'clock meeting <laughs> i said no i turned up at nine o'clock but why do you have it well we've always had the wednesday nine o'clock meeting and I said, yeah, but, but, but what purpose, you know, what value does it create? Well, and I have another question down here about connecting rituals, new habits, and daily reviews. So it sounds like one thing to look at is re reviewing your habits and creating Absolutely. new ones. Talk and, about and interrupting old habits. So, so, you know, often I will, if I sit in on a team meeting, I'll stop them halfway through. By the time I, I'll say, okay, can we quickly go around the room and ask, what value have we created in this first half of this meeting? And how could we create twice as much value in the second half? It's what I call my halftime team talk, you know, to go back to your sports analogy. Yeah. And, and that's, that's reflection in action. It's stopping the doing long enough to actually helicopter up and, and, and see what's, what's happening and, and, and adjust it in the moment. And what about creating new habits and 
any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wrote something just recently on habits. And I said, often it takes a new habit to break an old habit. Yeah, you, you, you don't break an old habit by just being committed to stop doing it. You replace it. You, you, you replace it with, 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 a, with a better discipline and habit. And, and a habit takes repetition and practice to make, to, to, to embed, right? And so um, we need some kind of, you know, new rituals like, um, I'll give you an example, in team meetings, rather than starting with the agenda, doing a, an, what I call an outcome-based check-in where we go around the, the, each team member and say, what's the, the most important thing we need to achieve before we leave here today? That's a new habit, which means we're starting with getting on the table. We're starting with the end in mind and getting on the table, what do we need to achieve together? So we need those new kind of rituals. But, but once we've, we've operated them for a year or two, we need to change them so that we're, we're constantly being agile and, and, and waking ourselves up rather than falling into uh, uh, repet unthoughtful repetition. Okay, and I mean, we're down to the last couple minutes. So uh, you, you talk, the last thing in that, that what we've been discussing is you, you describe some people who have daily reviews. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about what daily reviews look like? Well, you know, I think if you look at a lot of the stuff coming out of the, the, the agile teaming world, right? So, so they do things like uh, stand-ups for, for, for at, the, at the end of the day, or even in the middle is, is okay, let's just hear what's happening for each person. What, what, what do we achieve? What's the support you need from each other? How do we do that in very short time? But, and, and, what, and what have we learned today? Yeah. That's taken us to more effectiveness. Yeah, and yeah I think you refer to one executive who described something like he would review the people he was in contact with and how many of them he he did something good with. Yeah, this 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 was a new uh, one of the big four professional services firms, and he at a very young age had been elected chairman of one of the big territories, and he decided that. Uh, Part of his job was to inspire and motivate people. And so he said, well, let, let's keep a, a kind of record of that. And we worked on this. And he, he um, each day would write down how many people he'd met that day. And often that would run into tens or hundreds. And then he'd put a figure for how many could he put his hand on his heart and say, these are people I have motivated and inspired to achieve more than they thought they could. I How love I them. Yeah, and just that daily check on himself meant that every day he was changing how he engaged with people, and every day he was learning and developing. And I and In people could do, people could do that for how for how many people they were kind to, how many people they made smile, how many people they did something good for. I mean, the idea of a daily accounting of something like that, I think is a, is a, is a great concept. I'll give you one other. Uh, well, because I've been teaching this three-day program for quite a few years, I tell every group that the day I teach a three-day or one-year program, and I don't learn something new, teach something new, and upgrade something on the program is the day I stopped teaching it. So I told a group in Los Angeles, I said, listen, you've got a big responsibility because if I don't achieve those three things, I'm about to fly up to Vancouver and Victoria Island and there are 34 people waiting there for me. And I said, unless I achieve those three things, they're going to be very disappointed because they won't have a program. So you better help me learn something new, teach something new and upgrade something new. And and the courses then ask me what those three things are. And I have to constantly be modeling what I'm teaching. So I'm learning great. on every program. And, and that, I think that's a great place to finish. Unless there's any last minute thing you want to add. Y yep. So it also applies to podcasts as well, Rob. So uh, thank you for helping me uh, at least articulate something new on this program. And uh, I, I, I hope it's of value to all those who, who, who listen to it but even more valid to, to the difference they will make 
to the people that they're in service of. All right. Thank you for this opportunity, Rob. And my guest has been Peter Hawkins, professor in leadership at Henley Business School and founder of an emeritus chair of Beth Consultancy Group and the author of Leadership Team Coaching and Leadership Team Coaching in Practice.